And now here's your host of Helping Seniors of Brevard, none other than Joe Steckler. Hi, Joe. Hi, John, and thank you for uh, running the board today, you and Jim. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that Helping Seniors is just simply an organization that strives to get the best education, information, and uh, to help people uh, get uh, connected. Is Lee there? Yeah, I got you. Okay. I'm not going to talk to you yet, Lee. I want to talk to the people. Okay? I'll just sit here and listen. You, I can be you, one of the you, people you, you talk you, to. You just listen. John was telling me something. I think he was telling me that you were on the phone. And uh, I have a heck of a time reading lips. I just can't do it. I can't hear and I can't read lips. So I'm in a hell of a mess. <laughs> but anyway, uh, guys are wiggling their fingers at me and everything else. And I still can understand. My wife tells me, and she tells me to put the phone down so I can hear. And I can't hear anything because still there's noise coming out of the phone. But anyway, I'll start all over. Helping Seniors is an organization that is designed to help people. We compile information, resources. We find out what's available to help people in Brevard County. We make a list upon list of stuff. We catalog it in our files on our website. And we do this so that we can help you. And uh, callers call us with all kinds of questions, folks. Uh, you'd be surprised at some of the things that uh, people will call us and ask a question. And it turns out that they really need something other than what they've asked us for the information, help, and everything else. The important thing is to make the call and at least tell us what you think you need because it ties in exactly with what Dr. Sheldon wants to talk about today. And, and Dr. Sheldon did a, a column for our uh, newsletter and for Senior Scene Magazine and talked about where do I go for a second opinion? And but in that article, Lee, you talked about fact and opinion. And folks, today my panelist is Dr. Lee Sheldon. Dr. Sheldon is a periodontist. His uh, has practiced here locally. He also does uh, implants, and now he's. Uh, uh, I was going to make a joke, but I won't make a joke because I don't want to talk about a shaky hand for a dentist. But uh, <laughs> what was that? I, I knew I get you, I knew I get you laughing. Well, let me hear one. the joke. It's got to be better than that. <laughs> Your hand is still pretty steady because when you gave me my shot, when you did my implants, that's the best shot I've ever had in my wow. Games. Thank you. No, and I, 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 I can. I can say that you and another guy named Dr. Mason, I don't know if you know Mason or not, but Mason Mason gave a good shot too. And Mason was a guy that uh, cared about his patient. He did the same thing you do. Mason gave me his cell phone number and said, Joe, if you ever have a problem, you can call me anytime. And I know that you've done that with your patients, Lee. You, you give your patients access to you 24-7. Yep, you're because right. It's important. And But let's just talk about this here today. Uh, you know, when when you did the article where you where you go for a second opinion, I, I read the column, I proofread it, and I, but I, and I, and there's really no need for me to proofread what you said because it always is already excellently written. But uh, there are a lot of things that you said in that article and then you sent some some questions over for me today but uh, the title of your article was where do you go for a second opinion and then you wanted to uh, for me to ask you a little bit about about the second opinion and why you think it's necessary and, and I think it's becoming more important that people think about asking for a second opinion because of uh, not only the cost of medicine, but I, I'm i not sure that uh, medicine today is 
practice the same way it was when we had the old school doctors. And sometimes I wonder which is best, Lee. Well, I, you know, in one sense, we've got more advanced procedures now, and so you can't have the old school doctor anymore because the old school doctor wouldn't have enough training in enough different parts of the, of the specialties to be able to deliver the same services we have today. On the other hand, just because we can offer the services doesn't mean that you necessarily need the services. And the third thing is that just because a doctor says you need a service doesn't necessarily mean that it's best for you. So we've got these three different things going on here, and it becomes confusing, confusing for for the consumer. Um and I guess the first part of this, Joe, and, and I need your response to this because I can't just do a monologue here, is that we have the assumption that doctors know so much more and therefore we can't question the doctor. On the other hand, most medicine is simple enough that it should be easily understood by the consumer. And do you think that the consumer really understands at times what the doctor is telling them? I think the consumer doesn't understand what the doctor is telling him because the doctor is not a good communicator. I think the other thing is, is the doctors have biases, and those biases do not necessarily correlate with fact. Okay. So... Let's take a situation, and I think we discussed this on the air before, but I don't know, I think we did it on the TV show before, and it was probably two or three years ago. Okay. So we talk, we talk about a loved one, and she has a problem where she has blood in her stool, or actually it's found out first that through a, through the, through a blood test that She's weak that she has that she does it doesn't have enough red blood cells, and so you do the stool test, the one where you where you you do the home test, and you send it out and for them for them to, for a lab to evaluate what's in the stool, and they find blood in the stool. So the next step is to go see the gastroenterologist, okay, the one who specializes in the gut. The gastroenterologist does the colonoscopy discovers a lesion within the colon. And the lesion is not a polyp, it's a flat polyp. In other words, it's something that is flat and lined up with the intestinal wall. The doctor then uh, brings, uh, brings the patient out of anesthesia and says, you've got thus and so, I need you to see this surgeon. And so we go to see the surgeon, and the surgeon says, you need to have this removed because it has a very good chance of being cancer, and therefore the, the way to treat it is to do an abdominal incision and remove half of the large intestine. I go back to the gastroenterologist and say, and so then I start studying. And they start studying this lesion. And they find out that this lesion has, based on the literature, a 1.8% chance of being cancer. Not a big chance of being cancer, a 2% chance of being cancer. So I go back to the gastroenterologist and I say, is this the only way we can treat this? I said, what's the chance it's going to be cancer? She says, 75%. I said, no, 1.8%, because I just read that in the literature. We asked the doctor twice, isn't there another way? Finally, the third go-around, the doctor says, yes, you, there is somebody at Mayo Clinic who removes this thing, these things without doing surgery. He removes them through the colonoscopy. So the half the intestine doesn't need to be removed. In fact, we go up to Mayo Clinic and get the lesion treated exactly that way, through the colonoscopy, 
It's removed through the colonoscopy, no gut incision, no removal of the small intestine, uh, of large intestine, no nothing except to remove the lesion. Problem solved, do a follow-up colonoscopy, a year later, two years later, everything is fine. Now, I had to beg for the second opinion. Yeah, okay, Lee, but let's, let's go back a step. You're a, yep. you're a doctor, and... When you when you were were told something by one doctor, your medical background, your training enabled you to to really want to take a, another look at this because you you just based on your training and let's let's just talk about this for a second because we've never have talked about this before. We talked about difference between. Uh, different types of medical training, but we've never talked about at what point. Let's say you went, you and a guy that's going to be a, a a surgeon. You both go to medical school. You get your you get your degree, and 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 at what point do, did you differ and and take off to be a dentist and he takes off to be a surgeon how much of your how much of your training was common training before yeah uh, you uh you di- you diversed over to being a periodontist am i making sense yeah yeah but it's, it's actually dentist first then periodontist so as far as dentist goes um we shared the same types of training for the most part for the first 2 years and then we branch off into medicine and dentistry for the second two years. So, what, but, but my point was, you and you and you, a, a doctor and a dentist, have a heck of a lot of common training before you 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 you, you digress off to being in your specialty, right? Yep. So you got a good understanding of the skeletal frame of the body, the intestines, how things function, how they work. Um, you know, and when you talk about the the colonoscopy, you know, I mean, heck, I watched them do one of my colonoscopies. I watched them do the thing. I think it's pretty clean in there, and then I watched what what the heck they did. But and and I have also heard, because I've talked to you and I've talked to so many doctors and I've had so many medical procedures done on me, and people do call me and ask me for my opinion on something, and I get back into what you said, fact and opinion mine is strictly joe's opinion not a fact because i I'm, well i'm not an expert it's true but the doctor also is going by opinion don't forget we went to one doctor then we go to the second doctor and the second the other thing that could be offered isn't even offered by the doctor and so what do you have to do you have to start reading you have to start reading yourself and you can read yourself, and you don't have a medical. You don't have to have a medical background to be able to do it. Well, you know, you put down on one of these things. One of the one of the questions you 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 sent me was, uh, 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 let's see, where where do you go for an opinion, and, and and where do you go for health information? And it's the same thing as you. I asked you a question about this some months ago, and you mentioned the Cochrane Library. Yeah. And Lee, I went in there, and I've gone in there several times. And when, like, I typed one time, I wanted to know about uh, a knee problem. Heck, I typed in K N E E problem, and it came back and said no problem, K N O W. I couldn't get the full thing to change the back to my knee where I could find out. I knew what my problem was, but I couldn't get them to to, to say knee. These some of these sites are extremely complicated and hard to use. Well, let me go back for a second. Okay, you're right. You're you're go- you're not going to find knee problem, but your doctor, whoever the doctor is, has made a diagnosis. So let's assume it's tendonitis or or displaced patella or something like that. If you looked up patella on Cochrane Library, then you would find something. So you do have to get the doctor's first diagnosis, and you have to get it in the doctor's terms in order to be, in order to be able to, to look it up. Because knee problem is just too broad. 
Well, I I know what I, what I, I typed uh, when I mentioned I typed in rheumatologist one time, and the first thing it took me to was exactly what I wanted, and that was the uh, top subject called fibromyalgia, and I started looking at the numbers of studies that have been done on fibromyalgia over the years, and the the Cochrane Library. It, it gives you uh, numbers of people that have been involved in a study. And I, I saw one study where uh, they, uh, they, it was something like it was 732 patients have been involved in a study, and then a, a comparable study where 19,000 some people involved in a study. And that's, that's the advantage of, of, of knowing where to go to, uh, to get that second opinion or, uh, why in the why in the heck you need to get it in the first place? And I, they, they, when you put this stuff in layman's terms, yeah, uh, mm. I, I think there's a lot more that we can do if we know how to do it, Lee. Well, I, I think so. I mean, the Cochrane Library is good in that the Cochrane Library. First of all, <clears throat> a study does not equal a study. There's some studies that are highly biased. There's some studies that are objective. Um, the first thing the Cochrane Library will do will take uh, take a particular study. So let's talk about prostate for men. So we'll look at prostate, prostate cancer for men, and what it will do will be to review all the studies, and it will talk, it will discard those that are biased. So then you're looking at those that are unbiased, and at the top of the and and once you're looking at prostate cancer. At the top of the page, you'll see it written in doctor's language. If you scroll down to the bottom, it gives summary, which while it may be a little bit um, um, advanced English, it isn't that advanced. And so it will give you summaries at the bottom, which, by the way, is, is what I read, in order to be able to determine what I'm going to do. So, yeah, you've got to come up with the diagnosis first in order to be able to use the Cochrane Library. But once you do it does give you the objective information. One of the problems we have with fibromyalgia, so let's assume we go on the Internet on fibromyalgia. You're right, there's probably going to be 10,000 studies uh, on, on fibromyalgia. But if you go to the Cochrane Library, you might put in fibromyalgia, and it will give you the, it will give you the studies that are non-biased on that particular subject. Now, or often when you're looking at fibromyalgia, it could be in one place or another place, because you know fibromyalgia is a catch-all term that really doesn't have a firm diagnosis. So you might say fibromyalgia of the knee or something like that, and you may come up with something that uh, is more objective so you, so you, so you can um, so you can determine the um, you know, what you want to do, or you can, at least you can see what the data is on that particular subject. I'll give you an example on prostate. Um, on prostate... And when I was doing checkup, and that was 20 years ago, more than more than 20 years ago, um, yeah, close to 30 years ago now. Um, when I was doing checkup, when we were, check, we were looking at prostate, once you became a certain age, it didn't make any difference what treatment you did, whether you did prostatectomy, in other words, surgery of the prostate, whether you did chemotherapy, whether you did radiation, or whether you did nothing at all. If you looked at the long-term data there was no difference in the outcomes whether you treated it or not. Well, that's when, 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 I, uh, when that thing flipped me and over... And I'm talking about after the age of, and I think it was after the age of 59 or 65 or something like that. I'm not talking about early on in life. I'm talking about later in life. Well, you know, they, they, now, you know, you used to go in and, and you, when you got a, in the military, when you got a physical, they always checked... Uh, for prostate, always, always check your prostate, and then when you get yep. into civilian life, um, they stopped checking uh, prostates. I think at uh, age seventy-five, and uh, you know, there's, there's there's there are different opinions about. Uh, here we get in opinion and fact. Uh, there were different opinions as to why you should stop. Uh, checking the prostate and there are other opinions as to why you should continue checking so it goes back into that business about fact and opinion and 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 you as a doctor uh, you had you know you can offer an opinion but you got to be very careful about what the facts are when you talk about it or write about it am i correct or not 
Well, it's true. I mean, if you go in, if you go for, if you go in dentistry, I mean, this is common, happened commonly in my practice for, for my entire career. People go to a dentist, and the dentist says, "You need these teeth extracted; they can't be saved." And then they come to see me, and I say, "Of course, we can save them." Thirty years later, they have their teeth. All right, <laughs> whose opinion do you want to go with? Well. I know that when you started, when I first met you, you were doing a uh, TV show over at, um, oh gosh, it was Bright House, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Time Warner at that time. Yeah, you and Dr. Snyder. Yep. Yeah, and you, you did all kinds of topics. I was on your show several times, talked about Alzheimer's, and that's when I first met you. And uh, you, you all, you and Dr. Snyder did, did an awful lot about uh, uh, what your opinions were and why you did what you did. But there were there were things that you talked about on there that 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 offered opinions and uh, to uh, to the to the viewing audience that were based on fact because you and Dr. Snyder were very careful what what you said. But you know you could ask somebody their opinion. And and it, and it gets into where you wrap what what you're going to wrap around the axle, but uh, you know, w- over the years, you and I have talked so much about nutrition, healthy eating, uh, what you should do it, what you shouldn't do, and I one of my biggest uh, things that I've gone into uh, Lee, and in, and in, in looking, and I'm going to try the the Cochrane Library for it is in that. Uh, I'll probably call you for some advice on it, but I want to find out what the difference is between some of the stuff that these products that they put on the market that talk about nutrition, things like, I know one of them comes to my mind is Juice Plus. There are other products out there. But as I look for, uh, as I've gone to try to research these things on the Internet as opposed to the Cochrane Library, where I might get a better answer, uh, I can't. I can't find many studies that um, oppose what the proponents of these certain nutrition programs are stating. In other words, uh, it's like what they're saying is gospel truth, and there's no there's no opinion or anything about it. It's 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 a fact. That's what they want you to believe, and and I try to find out. Uh, what 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 is right? Because when, if I want to talk about it on on the radio or on a TV, I I want to know exactly what the heck I'm talking about. And, and, and what what do you comment on something like that? Well, I mean, just plus at, at least went to the efforts of having objective scientific studies done. You won't find it in the Cochrane Library, but you'll find the Juice Plus Library of of of. Um, of uh, studies that have been done at major universities across the world, um, and they were very good studies. You will some find some people say, "Listen, that stuff doesn't work; it doesn't make any difference." Um, but there are some studies to back it up. I think what a study doesn't look at is biological, what we call biological variability. In other words, you're different from me, and therefore what may work for you or what may work in the study may not work for me particularly. I stopped taking Juice Plus, for example. I recommend it, but I stopped taking it because it, it, it the side effects that I, I got from it were too great and made me uncomfortable, so therefore I couldn't use it. Does that mean the product is no good? No, the product's good, but I couldn't use it. You know, I, I finally had to give up on it. Okay. We're gonna, we're coming up on our mid show break, but when we come back, Lee, I, I want to talk about a, a, a book that you mentioned. And we're talking about making a, a diagnosis and everything like that. We're talking about yeah. medication. I, I want to talk about this book that you you talk about by, mm-hmm. by Doctor uh, Welsh, and I think it's important for people to know more about this because we can do a better job of educating ourselves. And with that thought, folks, we're going to take our mid show break, and uh, please stay with us because what Lee's going to talk about is very important. Welcome back to the second and half of the show, folks. Uh, I, I, I really want you to stick with us today because what Dr. Sheldon is talking about is extremely important to uh, to all of us, uh, especially non-medical types, just plain old civilian, because uh, we need to be more involved in um, 
asking questions about our own personal medical conditions. Dr. Shelton described a condition in the first part of the show, and maybe you'll have some other cons- uh, type thing you know, can, 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 can stay on the second part of the show because personal examples make all the, all the difference in the world, Lee, and you and I both know that. And, uh, you know, we get back to this business about what you, you think is a book that, that adults should read. And before I even ask you a question about the book, you know, most of us, we get so engrossed in watching uh, Netflix and uh, uh, the basketball games and everything else. And we don't and we, we pick up these uh, fiction books. I'm guilty of it. And but we read and need to read more of the fact books. And there are things that uh, that with the cost of medical care and with uh, so many different doctors, so many different uh, uh uh, types of things that can be addressed in the medical field. Uh, you, you're you're a firm believer, I know, in, in taking charge of your own medical condition a lot more than, than people are doing today. And, and is that why you think it's so important that people read this book by Dr. Welsh? Yeah, I do. I, the, the book is called Overdiagnosed. The book was published about uh, seven years ago. And, you know, you talk about the difficulty of getting through the Cochrane Library. And, you know, there is going to be some difficulty. You're right and actually getting into it and actually reading it. Um, but um, if you look at the book Overdiagnosed, it will, kind of, it will give you an idea as to what can occur if you fall into the medical system and don't have, have enough knowledge to know when you are being overdiagnosed. And so and our overdiagnosed results also in unnecessary tests sometimes very invasive tests, which end up making, just like I talked about with prostate cancer in older people, um, which probably don't make any difference at all in your health, but they will make a big difference in your anxiety because of the amount of tension you're paying because you've got to run the next test and the next test and the next test. And overdiagnosed goes over those and allows you to at least have a firm understanding based on the literature as to what those tests really mean and how reliable they are, and when you whether you want to go down that path or not. You know, you know that I've been um, diagnosed with fibromyalgia and some other uh, conditions, and I've had a stroke, and I've had uh, I had a dissecting aorta. So I've got a lot of things in my body. I have to be very careful. And at my age, there's so many things I can do, so many things I can't do, but. For years, I've been troubled by uh, my back problems and uh, leg problems, and this fibromyalgia contrib- contributes so many different. Uh, it affects so many different parts of the body. At least, that's what the doctors think. And 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 to me, I'm not sure uh, just what needs to be done. I've been on so many medications and. I know that I, uh, uh, for, for instance, there's a, a medication called gabapentin. Gabapentin. Gabapentin is a uh, a medicine that's used to control the uh, nerve endings in the body and it, 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 the nerve centers, and uh, and the nerve endings are connected right back to the brain, and that's how you feel pain in your body. But if, if I have I have gone to several different. Well, let's put it this way. I've been to, to many different types of pain clinics, not because I'm a hypochondriac, but because I've been trying to figure out what is the best treatment for whatever I have. And all I know is that for, for many years, I've hurt, and the pain does not stop. So I go to these places, and I see uh, I see these pain clinics filled up with people and I, I, for the most part, I'm watching them get in there. Some of them, well, many of them don't even have a cane or a crutch or, or, or a rollator or anything. They're just walking on their own, yet they're in these pain clinics. And I'm thinking to myself, if I tried it, I'd fall flat on my face and, I, and I'd and able to break a bone. So, and I, I, and then I started to think, how am I doing the right thing? And then when I have to wait three, four, five, six months to get a, uh, a treatment that that could possibly give me some relief. I wonder what the heck am I really doing? Am I going the right direction? And and I've talked to you about this before, but sometimes you know you, you are at the mercy of the medical programs because uh, you like to believe that 
that you can get some relief somewhere. And and, and I, I almost absolutely refuse to uh, take extra doses of medication to, to try to stop the pain because I just don't want to go that route. And I've, I've, I've done it a couple of times over the, I'm talking, I'm talking about 10, 10, 12 years. And, but I think I have a pretty strong constitution. But even at that, I, I know that for myself and speaking um, personally, I would like to know more about, uh, you know, uh, diagnoses and, uh, uh, and how important that is and, and what the average lay person could get out of a book by Dr. Welsh. Is it something as complicated layers as something a, a guy like me could understand? No, it's something a guy like you could understand, although it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be addressing you. It wouldn't be addressing your problems. Because when you're looking at the book Overdiagnosed, essentially it's, I feel fine, but here's what showed up on the test, here's what showed up on the CAT scan, here's what showed up on the x-ray, and therefore you have to follow this particular line of more and more and more diagnostic tests to determine something. It's looking more at that. It's taking a look at the asymptomatic person, the person who doesn't have pain, the person who doesn't have symptoms of any kind, and what shows up on a test often leads you down the road of more and more diagnostic tests. Well, what about on the other hand, if you if you're if you sort of try to take charge of your own health care, if you're not if you're not happy, if if you feel that well, let's let's put it this way. If I can feel pain in my legs and my body and I can't hardly walk can I? How can I attribute? If unless they do some kind of of, uh, since I can't have an MRI because of a pacemaker, then there are CAT scans and things like that 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 can uh, can analyze the soft tissues in the body and, and and help people try to figure out what's causing the problem. That, I guess that's the Correct. question. But you, but you and I aren't talking the same. We're not talking about the same thing now. We're not talking about the same thing. Say it again. Okay, you have pain. You have pain. You want to get a diagnosis. That makes sense. But if you had no pain and you had nothing that occurred and you happened to take a screening test of some kind and something showed up, and then you continue to take tests, which then result in more invasive tests, which may involve biopsies or something like that, the, the title of the, enti- of the entire book, Joe, is this, Overdiagnosed, Making people sick in the pursuit of health. Well, I could understand that for going to six. I mean, you know, that's what we're talking about. Oh, okay. Well, so we're taking somebody who might be going whistling a happy tune, walking down the street, decides to get a screening test of some kind, and it puts him or her down the line of more and more tests. And what it what what this shows is is the data that supports or doesn't support the use of these tests. And it's simple enough to read that a layperson can say, all right, now I get it. Now, it, it doesn't apply to you. It doesn't. It, it, it would apply to somebody who's feeling okay. Lee, I, in, in, in the work that I've been doing over the years, I have come across people that are terrified of becoming addicted to um Painkiller drugs, and they have been prescribed these medications by doctors simply because the doctors knew these people were in such pain that they needed help to get through a day. Yet these people, they may live in a different state, and different states have different. Uh, well, they, they they have laws that are different and cause the uh, people who live in those states to have a different perspective on uh, on on accepting. Uh, painkiller type drugs and I, I know for a fact because I've talked to people that this has happened to that they're afraid to take or tell a doctor that they know there there are do- drugs that will help them because the uh, doctors in that state they live in um, the reporting systems are so stringent that uh, the people are afraid to take the drugs to alleviate the pain and that's that's an awful situation to be involved in Lee. Well, it is. I mean, you know, that is the last resort because you're no longer treating the problem. You're treating the symptoms of the problem. And essentially, there's been no way, or at least the person hasn't discovered any way 
um, to get around it. I mean, we can talk about people who may have um, allergy problems. Those allergy problems may result in pain. Well, if the allergy was never diagnosed, then you're taking pain medications when, in fact, if you had had a reasonable treatment with an allergist or something like that, or if you had avoided the things you're allergic to, you might feel better. I'm just giving a you know, a, a, a possible example. Okay. Um, when you don't get to the cause of the problem, and instead you're covering up the problem, which, by the way, isn't just pain medications, a lot of things that we're doing. Um, you're covering up the problem, then you essentially are, I've given up on trying to get to the cause, or I don't know where to go to get to the cause, or I've tried everything I know how to do to get to the cause. All right, so let's cover it up with something else. I know, and you, it, you, may, it may apply to the diabetic as well. Okay, so I keep on eating badly, eating badly, eating badly, eating badly. My pancreas has finally given up. All right, I'm going to continue to eat badly, and I'm going to take insulin. Or you've just used up your body, and you have no choice but to take insulin or to take some oral medications because, in some way, you abused yourself early on. Well. There are, there are dietary controls you can use that might reduce or limit the amount of medications you have to take. But you've got, to, if, if the cause is I'm eating too much ice cream, well, then is the next step I'm willing to stop ice cream so I can reduce the amount of medication. You just used a heck of an example there when you started touching on ice cream. You could have stayed away. You could have stayed away from that because <laughs> ice cream is my favorite dessert. Gee, many sakes! Why is it that when I ask you a question, you always you always really really tear me apart? And 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 then my wife hears you talk about this stuff, and then and then she won't give me the ice cream. <laughs> I'm sure Terry isn't listening to us right now, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Lee, when, when you and Dr. Snyder interviewed doctors many years ago on no, your Pedro TV show. and I show, had a great time together. We, we did this for five years. It was, a, it, was, it was a great five years that we did this together. Yeah, yes. but, Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What did you, what did you find when you interviewed other doctors and you asked them questions about what you and I are talking about today? It depended on the doctor. It really did. But for some doctors, they were so entrenched in their system that despite what the literature said, they still believed in what they were doing. Even though the literature might not have, might not have supported what they were doing, they still believed in them. And it was tough. And we would cross-examine. It was only so far you can go on TV. But, yeah, I mean... It, it's not just objective diagnosis. It's here's what I do, and therefore here's what I do, and so I've got to continue to do what I do, despite what the literature might say. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, when we talk about fact and opinion, now this is not this is not an opinion. This is a fact. The United States of America is probably one of the most rapidly aging countries outside of Japan. In the United in, in the world, and we are getting more and more older people. And uh, I have seen it written uh, that there are medical programs are producing fewer doctors than we did years ago, compared uh, to the numbers of people that are that that need the type of doctor. And I'm I'm thinking a geriatric care doctors, and that's a that's a um, that's a uh, um, that's something that that more and more people need to think about because the geriatric medicine is is a field all in itself, and I know that uh, the geriatric doctors I've talked to um, are uh, they try to get to the basic cause of a person's problem, and that's not always the easiest thing as you get older because you got so many medical th- things that affect you. That you've got to try and and I think one of the things that we do as we get older is is as we try and it's, it's a terrible thing to say I don't do it but I know people that at when they go to their doctors they will not tell their doctors the truth about a condition that they have so then what we do is we are tying that doctor's hand and we are we are we are committing a, a, a real sin against 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 this poor doctor because 
A doctor cannot treat you unless they really, really know what your problems are. And here I get into the business of uh, stress disorders, anxiety disorders, and uh, eating disorders, and and, and, and things like that. It, it, it's an awful thing to, to expect a doctor to help you when you're not telling a doctor the truth. Well, it's true. I don't know. I, I, I don't know about this part of it because... I mean, there are a whole lot of things that are involved in this country that may not be involved someplace else. The freedoms the manufacturers have to do to or have to put certain things into products that might make us more addictive are freedoms that other manufacturers don't in other countries don't have. So, I mean, there there are things that are, uh, you know, we've got more medical care, we've got more doctors here than anyplace else. But there are also things that we're doing to ourselves uh, in the name of profits that may require us to see more doctors here than anyplace else. If It's a problem. It's a problem. And it may be, you know, doctors should be, doctors for the most part are last resort type of people. They're, they're not first resort people. If you're looking for basics in nutrition, doctors aren't trained in nutrition. They aren't. So if, if you're looking to understand what the best thing is for you, an MD is not the one who's trained in that unless they've trained specially in that, especially in that after that doctor got out of medical school because it doesn't happen in medical school. So if we're looking at the basic care of the body, the care of the frame of the body, you know, we're talking about the typical things of diet and exercise. You're much better off. You know, a doctor isn't going to tell you what to do. You, a physical therapist might, a exercise physiologist might, but not a doctor. So, you know, are we are we placing too much um, too much responsibility for our care uh, with doctors because doctors' visits are paid for by Medicare? Perhaps. You know, it may be that we have to get used. The idea that we have to pay a little bit in order to be able to get the advice that we need, because the advice we may need may not come from medicine, since medicine is there to treat the end result of disease, where there are lots of other ways to prevent disease. But but you're not going to get that out of out of out of a physician. Physician doesn't have the time, and as I said, in some areas, the physician doesn't have the training. Are you familiar with the medical program, Lee, that's uh, sort of springing up here in our country? Where uh, people will pay, say, fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars a year to a doctor, and that doctor then becomes accessible to them twenty four seven. If they have a question, they 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 can they can go to that doctor for almost any kind of a medical problem they have. What do you think about something like that? Concierge medicine, yeah, concierge medicine. I think is is the response to the doctor uh, to, to to doctors being too busy and having to see. Uh, so many people in order to be, be able to reimburse properly, and so you pay a certain amount in order to be able to have a doctor that's more dedicated to you. We have concierge doctors right here in, in Brevard County. Yeah, well, one of, I, somebody I know very, very close to me is, uh, has done that, and they've been, they've been very, very, very satisfied with uh, the results of the program. And I know that uh, most people don't follow this thing, but I've got a guy down in Palm Bay that uh, is very good about... Uh, watching uh, the changes to the VA and changes to the health care system, and, and he sees something he thinks I need to know, he'll send it to me. And uh, one of the things that uh, that we're looking at, is, and um, I don't know how serious Congress is going to get about it, but uh, several years ago uh, the, uh, the Congress changed the uh, retiree program, medical program for uh, – for uh, uh, military retirees, and, and set, they put them on what are called Tricare, Tricare for Life, and uh, yeah. said we didn't need a secondary insurance. And now, uh, based on the, the cost of uh, just operating a fleet, uh, the Navy and, and and the other armed forces may be forced to uh, to, uh, to 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 change and, and go back to the old way of doing things because. Uh, the, the personnel and medical costs are, are becoming so large that they're detracting from the ability to uh, field an Army, field an Air Force, and field a Navy. It, it costs billions of dollars, and I know a lot of people don't know, but it costs about $12 billion to build an aircraft carrier. 
and it takes something like seven or eight years to construct a darn thing. Uh, it's not something that happens overnight, and, uh, you know, we want to prepare for our, uh, our military preparedness has got to be met, but at the same time, we have to take care of our people to, uh, to man a fleet and to, to, uh, to field an army and field an air force. So these are, these are all things that, uh, these are changes to our system that more and more people have to be aware of. And that's why I think it's important that we have discussions like you and I have where we talk about things that are not, you're a dentist and I, I, I try to do a radio show and I try to do, uh, to do the radio show based on the best information I have and getting people on this radio show that uh, are not afraid to talk to the people about what they really need to look at. And and I know that as a dentist, you're, you're a top-notch dentist, a periodontist, and you do all these things well, and you're as good as anybody else around. And But how does Lee Sheldon feel about as a doctor, as a dentist, about going out and uh, asking for a second opinion and, and, and trying to uh, be involved in your own health care, Lee? Well, I think yeah, I think Lee Sheldon, uh, and, and don't say that it's just because I know something about medicine, um, it's Lee Sheldon will challenge his doctors. <laughs> he does. <laughs> I get along with my doctors, but they know that when they see me, I'm not necessarily going to um, take the first thing they say to me because I've studied. Um, I've studied before I go in. So if Lee Sheldon had a rare problem um, where the physician says, listen, you got a rare problem, and I, and I like my doctors, I do. I have two pri- I have two primary doctors that I see there in the medical profession, and I like both of them, and I think they're they're both top notch. And yet, it doesn't mean that I'll cha- I won't challenge them um, based based on the literature. But I, I can tell you, there was one doctor who said, "Listen, I don't see this all the time. I want you to find you know I want you to go to the expert, and here's where I want you to go." And I instead looked at the literature to find out who ran the study on this particular problem that I have, and I went to that guy instead. So there, there are some advantages to be able to read the medical literature. I just don't think it's as difficult as, the, as we think it is. And so whether we're going to the Cochrane Library or whether we go to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, and type in the problem, you can, if you start reading a little bit, and it might take you a few hours to get used to it, you are going to be able to get some more objective data about any problems you have. So besides Cochrane, Pub, PubMed is the other one to go to. You know what? I'm just glad that I could talk to you as a radio host and not as your doctor. I wouldn't want to be your doctor. <laughs> I think yeah, be but, terrible My thing. doctors probably are well, saying the same thing. Oh, Lee's coming in? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> All joking is that we're, we're, we're out of time, Lee, and I, I want to thank you for being on the show with me today. I, 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 I know there's, uh, there are things that uh, I think and hope that the people that listen to the show, I hope we have caused them to want to think a little bit about their own medical conditions. And with that thought, I'll thank you and I'll thank our sponsors and I'll thank our listeners for being with us on the air today. And, uh, I wish you ever luck over there uh, filling those teeth and and tell Matthew to to make sure he puts the right amalgam in there, okay? (laughs) Yeah, I'll tell him. So you don't use amalgam? (laughs) We don't use amalgam, so we're done. (laughs) Okay, well, well, let's see. I learned something. Okay. All right. (laughs) I'll talk to you you later. (laughs) Thank you, Lee. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.